Okay, I am, uh, I started the recording, so we're, we're now recording the Bible study, um, and it'll, again, I'll, I'll do my best to post this up on YouTube. This should be a better recording even than the other ones, because I'm going to record this on my computer rather than on Zoom, so this will be as good a recording as I can get. Hey, hey there, Erica. Hi, Erica. Hi. Uh, welcome, you welcome. Glad to have you here. Um, we are still waiting on a couple more people, but I think we're going to start. Um, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to look into your word together. Uh, there's some great, exciting things we get to look into today. So I, I'm just really, really thrilled. Um, but I pray that you would um, open our hearts, open our eyes open our ears, help us to see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear, help our hearts to receive what you want us to receive. Please fill us with your Holy Spirit and wisdom. Uh, as Jesus uh, taught about, uh, about the end times, Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow in both wisdom and in, uh, in emotional strength, uh, that we would both not be deceived and we would not be alarmed, um, and that you would do good things, uh, Lord, through, uh, through this study tonight. Amen. 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 Hi there, Nana. Hi. Hello. All right. So I'm trying something new on uh, on the internet today. So we're using a different setup. Hopefully, it's a better a better camera quality and hopefully better internet quality for you on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> Last couple of weeks on Zoom, what's happened is uh, you guys watching have gradually gotten delayed so that by the end of the Bible study, you're about two minutes, two minutes behind us in terms of time. Um, and so I don't know what, I didn't know what to do about that other than to try something completely different. So we're, we're trying something completely different today. All right. So, um, we, we uh, have been talking through the Old Testament on uh, the end times, right? We've done some stuff out of Genesis and uh, some other books in the first study. So we had Genesis and uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, and, we did, and then we did a bunch of Jan Daniel, right? So we did, spent a couple of weeks on Daniel. Um, we're going to move. There's, there's plenty more in the Old Testament that we could look at, right? There's some stuff in Ezekiel. There's stuff in... Uh, other other Old Testament books, but I just wanted to give you a flavor for what's there. Um, we're going to um, move now to the New Testament, and I want you also to see that the New Testament has a ton to say about the end times. In fact, it's very difficult to find a New Testament book that doesn't talk about the end times, okay? So no, doesn't mean we're going to study all of it, but we're going to study some of it, and um, my goal, as always, is to give you, not to give you like concrete, hard and fast answers on what's going to happen, but to give you all the, the building blocks so you can, you can prayerfully discover what you believe about the end times, okay? I have my own beliefs about the end times, and I've been talking about those as we go along. Um, but I, I don't want to convince you of one particular way to view the end times. I want to give you what the scripture says and help you to make up your own mind. Okay. Um, we are using the Rose Guide to End Times Prophecy. And I don't know if any of you have bought this, but it gives a lot of background stuff on what we're talking about, including what are the major end times positions, like one of the major philosophies of, of interpretation of the end times. And, um, it's a great book, it's an inexpensive book, and it's really well put together. I'm very impressed with it. Um, we're not uh, studying it page by page, but it is forming the backbone of the stuff that we're talking about uh, in the class. So if you want more in-depth information, uh, this is the book uh, that I'm recommending right now. And it's also not gonna tell you what to believe. It's gonna tell you what Christians in general believe and you can compare and contrast and, and see how it lines up with what you see in the scripture. Now, I want to talk now about the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament, because um, we've talked before 
about prophecy and about how um, sometimes with prophecy, there is a, a parallax effect. There's the, the two mountaintops effect, okay? You, uh, we talked about this as, you know, you're, you're hiking and you see, you know, what appears to be one mountain with like two peaks, okay? But then as you hike around um, and you, you change, your, 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 you get closer to the mountain, it's, you start to see that actually there's two mountains there. And what you once thought was one mountain is really two mountains um, as, you, as you walk around and get closer to the mountains. That's often what prophecy is like. Um, a prophecy is given in the Old Testament and it looks like a prophecy of one event. But as you start walking closer to the New Testament, you start to realize that there are two events in view, not just one event. And so oftentimes those two mountains are the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, right? Um, and uh, that's definitely going to be the case, even in the New Testament. Even in the New Testament, Jesus is going to teach about his second coming. And he's going to teach about his second coming in ways that seem like he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Okay. But as you got closer to 70 AD, you started to realize not all of this is really being, if, uh, was really happening then. Um, some of it is going to happen when Jesus returns the second time. And when is that going to be? We don't know. And neither did Jesus. Right? So the two mountaintops approach to prophecy, I think, is important for us to realize. But um, with that in mind, there... The, the, the one mountaintop view from the Old Testament of the, 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 ju the coming judgment, the day of the Lord and the coming judgment was as follows, okay? Time was kind of going along, right? Up, up, up. Who knows how far back, right, to the creation. Time's humming along. Bad times are happening. Ah, uh, you know, we, we had the, the whole timeline of the Old Testament there, you know, the divided kingdom, things like that. But it's supposed to go on, and then the Messiah would come and would usher in the new age, okay? Uh, the, the kingdom of God would fully come, and uh, the Messiah would bring it into being, okay? That's, that was the view in the Old Testament of how things uh, were going to go. Here would come the Messiah, and he would set everything right. Boom. One and done, right? When Jesus came, though, Jesus made it pretty clear that it was not going to be like this. Um, and he tried to teach his disciples about this. He's teaching them, teaching them, teaching them, teaching them this, and they just aren't getting it. They don't get it until he dies, right? And rises from the dead. And then they see that, wait a second, something's different than what we were expecting, okay? And here's, here's how it looks. And I, I sent a handout to you of this, but I'm going to draw it up on the board, too. This is, this is what it, it really looks like, as far as we can tell, okay? Like this one? Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna label this, this age, okay? And this goes back to creation, okay? Um, this age is run, run along, okay? And into this age comes Jesus, the Messiah, okay? I'm gonna put Jesus here, earlier on the line. Into this age comes the Messiah, okay? Jesus comes. He is the Messiah. He uh, is crucified. He rises from the dead, okay? And what Jesus says uh, is that the kingdom of God is at hand, okay? The kingdom of God is at hand. This is one of, one of Jesus's major emphases when he preaches. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the way that I think it's best to think about this is with the word inaugurated. Okay? Jesus came and he inaugurated the kingdom of God. He brought the kingdom of God into this world and started the kingdom of God here. Okay? Um, much like we're going to have a presidential election, right? And there'll be an inauguration of the, of the new president or of the returning president, um, that inauguration is the beginning of the president's term, 
It's not the end. Right? It's not the complete thing. The inauguration is the beginning of that term. So Jesus came in and he inaugurated what I'm going to call the age to come. Or the, or the kingdom of God. Okay? The age, the, the age to come, the kingdom of God. Jesus inaugurated the kingdom of God. Okay? There's going to come a day when Jesus comes back. Okay? Maybe we'll call this, maybe we'll do two arrows. Jesus comes back and he takes, he takes his disciples to be with him. And, and, and here you'll have, you know, the, the, you call this the end times. You call this the judgment. You call this the day of the Lord. Whatever you call it, this is the second coming of Jesus. This is the return of Jesus. He comes in, he steps back into our history, and he brings our history to a close and fully realizes the kingdom of God. Okay? There's that great Martin Luther hymn. The kingdoms of this world, they have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Right? Um, the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God here. Um, this is where the kingdom of this world wraps up. The kingdom of our God is inaugurated. Where we live right now, you and I and all of us, right, is somewhere in here. Okay? Um, we, all of us, are here, believers, right, in Jesus, and we are experiencing the kingdom of God now in our lives, in the rule of Jesus in our lives. We're experiencing it in the life of the body of Christ, in the fellowship that we have with one another, in the forgiving of one another, for the forgiving we have of, of our sins with God, right? Restoration of relationship with God, all of that. We have that now, but we don't have it fully yet. So we're right now living between the now and the not yet. We're living between the now and the not yet. We are now living in the kingdom of God, but we're not fully, the kingdom of God has not fully come. This was the picture that the Old Testament saints had of the coming of the Messiah. This is the picture that we're taught in the New Testament about the coming of the Messiah. That Jesus came in, he inaugurated the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God will last forever. The, we talked about the stone, right, that was not cut out, but not by human hands, that would destroy the kingdoms of this world and would become a mountain that fills the entire world and, and reign forever, right? That's this, right? This is the this is the, the stone in Daniel chapter two. This is the this is the, um, the the kingdom of the Son of Man in Daniel chapter seven. Um, is going to come in. It's going to destroy the kings of this world, but it's going to take time. And we're in here. We're in this, in this zone is where we are. So, uh, oh yeah. So I had, that's the, the difference between, for those of you who are scholars of history, the difference between D-Day and V-Day. Okay. Um, on D-Day, the allied troops stormed the beaches at Normandy and they won a decisive battle. Once D-Day happened, there was no way that the Allies were going to lose World War II, okay? World War II was brought effectively to an end on D-Day. That assault broke the German lines and made it impossible for the Germans to hold on in Europe, okay? But it took months and months and months, I think over a year before V-Day, which was Victory Day, and the armistice was signed to end uh, World War II. So, we're in between D-Day, right? The decisive victory has been won. Jesus has come. Jesus won the victory. The, the kingdom of this world cannot possibly stand. But we haven't reached the end of the battle yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. So tonight we're going to talk about Jesus. 
my favorite topic. <laughs> we're going to talk about Jesus tonight. And we're going to hear from Jesus' lips what Jesus had to say about the end times in his parables. Okay? Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus' direct teaching on the end times. But tonight, we're going to cover the parables of Jesus and what Jesus taught about the, the, the end times in his parables. One of the fun things, and I, I think this is going to maybe be shocking for some of you. It was shocking for me, so I hope it's shocking for you. And this is that m most of Jesus' parables are about the end times in some way, shape, or form. Okay? He talks about the end times all the time in his parables. We just aren't listening for it. And so tonight, what I'm hoping to do is that we'll listen for the end times aspects of his parables. We're going to break into three groups. This is why we needed a good Zoom tonight. If you're hearing me right now, uh, put your thumb up. Okay, great. So we are, we are on. Okay, so we are, there's no delay here. We need a good Zoom for this because we're going to break into three groups. One of the groups is going to be here in this room. Okay, you ladies at this table will be one group. Okay, and then I don't know how it's going to assign you, but you on Zoom, you're going to be divided into two groups, two breakout groups, and uh, you're going to be, uh, we're all, each of our groups is going to look at two passages of scripture. Okay. So let me see here. I'm gonna I'm gonna manually assign these groups because the truth is, I have to know who's in each room, or else I can't assign the uh, the texts. So, all right. So we're gonna assign uh, the Kosakowskis with Kurt Whitson and with uh, Debbie. Lockard. Okay. You guys are going to be room number one. So in room number one, you guys are going to study these two passages. Are you ready? Write this down. Okay. Uh, in room number one, your passages are going to be, let me get this one here. Um, your passages are going to be Matthew. They're all in Matthew. Okay. you mean Matthew 22 verses 1 through 14. I just, I preached about this a while back. Uh, this is the parable of the wedding feast, okay? Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. That's for the Kosakowskis, Kurt Whitson, and Debbie Lockard. And the second passage is the passage I preached on Sunday, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Okay, write those down. Matthew 22, 1 through 14, and Matthew 25, 1 through 13, okay? That's going to be in breakout room one. In breakout room two is going to be Erica Henry, uh, Karen and David Joya, Beverly Addo, and my mom, okay? You guys are going to be in breakout room two. And your passages, write this down. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. This is the passage I'm preaching on this Sunday, the parable of the talents, okay? Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. And then Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, the passage I'm preaching on the following Sunday, the sheep and the goats. Okay, so you're doing Matthew 25, 14 through 30, and 31 through 46, two of his parables. Now, here's what I'd like you to look for. Okay, this is for everybody. I want you to ask the question, in this passage, what is Jesus teaching about the end times? Okay, what is Jesus teaching about the end times? What's his point? Why does he say this? Why, why is this what he says about the end times? What, what, do you, what do we learn about the end times from Jesus? Okay. And then the second question I want you to ask is, 
looking at the two stories that you have, what do these two stories have in common? Okay, what do they have in common? Uh, what are they, what are they both saying about the end times? Okay, so uh, what's Jesus teaching and what do they have in common? Okay, I'm going to send you guys out for uh, I'm going to say 20 minutes, okay, to study these two passages. If that's not enough, we'll, uh, we will, we'll give you more, okay? But uh, it'll be 20 minutes. Um, at any time, you can come back here into the main room. Um, but I'm, I've got it for 20 minutes. There'll be a countdown timer in your room during the last 60 seconds, okay? Um, but that, those, are the, those are the things. Any questions before I send you into your rooms? Because it's going to be tough for me to answer questions once you go in your rooms. Okay? We're going on an adventure. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys in 20 minutes. Now, do they see each other now? They are going to see each other. Yeah, so they, the and they can't hear four of Yeah, wow. so it'll be, it'll it's be. Amazing. I didn't know Zoom could do that. I didn't know. I'm not a tech person, so I'm like totally lost. All right, so Beverly, Beviato is either frozen or I don't know. It looks like she's frozen. She's, she's not. Right. So our passages are Matthew 13. We're, we're earlier. Matthew 13, verse 24 through 43, the parable of the weeds of the field. And Matthew 13, verses 47 through 50. So let's, let's, uh, let's read the parable of the weeds in the field first. Um, Donna. Would you read verses 24 through 30? Yeah. And that's the, that's the parable of the weeds in the field. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then Nicole, would you read verses 31 and 32? And let's say uh, 31 through 35, do that, okay? okay? And then Sue, you'll read 36 through 43. Okay. 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 Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where, did, where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. All right, Donna, 30, I mean, uh, Nicole, 31 through 39. So 35. 35, yes, okay. 35, 30. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. So what's fulfill what was spoken through the prophet? I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter in things since the creation of the world. Sue, so 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds 
comes of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, out of his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Great. Very good. All right, let's, let's briefly talk about this passage before we go on to the next one and then try to, and we'll compare them once we do. Um, so we, we read here three parables and an explanation of one of them, okay? So the first parable is the weeds in the field parable. What do we learn about the end times from the weeds in the field I'm going to just give you a heads up. I'm going to ask every group to share what they've learned. Mm -hmm. So one of you will share what we learned. Uh, well, I'm thinking that, um, so we're just going to have to deal with the sin until the end. Okay. Yeah. But the thing that we're, I was thinking of is, okay, so once these seeds, these weeds, the devil came and he scattered the weeds. I would like to think the weeds are going to have a chance to become... <laughs> Sure. Wheat, yep, absolutely. but it, this doesn't make it sound like they will. So he doesn't cover mm -hmm. everything here, but but it, um, certainly a lot of other stories tell us that it's possible for the weeds to become wheat. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the good. That's a good observation. The, so the weeds and the wheat are people. Yeah. Okay. Um, and what do we learn about those people in relation to the end times? There's going to be a judgment. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a separation of both sets of people. So judgment, there's a separation of two types of people, right? Um, the harvest is the end of the age, mm -hmm. right? So the, this, we know he's talking about the end times because mm -hmm. he, he says it, right? right? He says the harvest is the end of the age. Um, um, what else? So, like, I don't know if that, but it says... While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds. Okay. Um, now, is the sowing of the seeds part of the end times? Yes. I don't think the sowing is. The reaping is. Yeah, the reaping is. Yeah, so he says the harvest is the end of the age. Okay. So the end of the age is the time of harvest. So the sowing of the seeds, though, is important, right? Uh, yeah. The... the the, the, so this is getting disciples. Yeah. Right, it's, it's making disciples, absolutely. And, and Jesus is making disciples, and the enemy is making disciples, right? They're both, mm -hmm. they're both in the same field. They're both growing, they're both growing their own disciples, right? Mm -hmm. So good, yeah, good observation. I think it's also, I'm surprised that it's, um, the idea is to let the weeds and the wheat be on their own, grow together, you don't weed them out now. Yeah. Which I had never really thought of this in terms of the end times. So that's kind of an interesting idea that uh, we shouldn't be weeding out the enemy now. Well, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a parable for the church, right? I mean, as we are in the church, sometimes we ask the question, you know, why is the church so full of sinners, right? Mm -hmm. You know, do we know? who are genuine Christians and who are not genuine Christians, right? Um, do we have in our congregation today, you know, do we have some people who are genuinely following Jesus and some who are, you know, might be following Jesus from impure motives or who want to appear as if they're following Jesus but aren't really, you know? I mean, any church we have that. Sure. Any church, absolutely. And, and sure. so what I, one of the things I love, and I, I always use this parable when I'm talking about this is I love just encouraging people. Look, Jesus says that the angels don't know the difference, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> the angels might not be able to tell the difference between the genuine saints and the, and the disciples of the evil one. And if the angels have a hard time doing it, no shock that we have a hard time doing it. Yeah. But at the end, they're going to, it will be very clear. Absolutely. Right. Because they ask like, where did the, the, 
the um the weed come from so yeah. it would show that they at some point in time begin to see a different but it's it, like you said it's it's talking about the church i never tied that in together but the notation on the side of my bible talks about church discipline right and so we we do we do church discipline through and there's other passages that encourage church discipline um this one jesus is saying look it's hard it's not easy but at the end of the age which is what we're talking about at the end of the age the weeds are gathered and what happens to the weeds that are gathered they're set aside for burning they're put aside for burning right um, and what happens to the wheat? They're brought into the barn. Brought into the barn. Yeah. Um, and so what's the result for the, the evildoers? Like what, what, what does Jesus say about the fate of the weeds? They're burned. But what, what, is, what does he say? The, the, the weeds are burned, but when they're people, what, what happens to them? It's, it's a final Jesus. separation from God that, well, eternal damnation, I would say. Sure. What, what, what do you, where do you see that in the passage? What does Jesus explicitly say? Well, when he says, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt. Right. Then gather the weeds and bring them into my right. barn. So what else does he say? So that's, the, that's what he's talking about. The, he's still talking the parable there. Then he starts to teach about what happens to the actual people. My old church is going to throw them into the blazing furnace. Throw them into the blazing furnace, right? Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. But this is this is Jesus' teaching about the fate of those who are judged harshly, right? And what's the fate of those who are judged uh, joyously? What's the fate of the of the, the wheat, the, the good people, the, the genuine disciples of Jesus? What does he say? They will be brought into the Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, right? It says actually the kingdom of their father, which I love, right? It's, it's, it's not even just the kingdom of God, but it's the kingdom of their father. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will shine like the sun. So is there any place in the Bible that talks about like at this end, they'll get one last chance? Because that, because I don't like that. <laughs> I mean, I hate that yeah. there's going to be we, people that aren't going to go to uh, heaven, but I guess they've had they're having their chances now. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're going to get a last chance. No, it's so it's a, yeah. There's so many passages where Jesus says things like, I never knew you. Yeah. Or he says, my sheep knows my voice, but there are other sheep. Yeah. So like if you know, it would make you think that even from the get-go, he knew not everyone was going to end up being his disciple. It's out of their own choices. Right. Oh, yeah. I so, know, it's kind of still sad. <laughs> so we see a lot here about the end times in this parable. Oh, yeah. So let's let's talk about the next parable, the kingdom, the, the grain of mustard seed parable, 31 through 31 32. What in there is about the kingdom of heaven? The small seed that becomes a mighty tree that gives cover to the birds of the air. Right, it becomes a tree that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. So maybe a stretch to say this is the end times, but it, it's, he's talking here about the gathering together uh, of all the people in safety. Right? It's a beautiful picture, I think, a, a small snapshot of what the kingdom of God fully come will be like, right? the birds of the air making nests in their... And here I was thinking, well, I know we're talking about the end times, that even just though the spreading of the gospel started out small... Yes, absolutely. People. That is absolutely what this parable is oh, about. Okay. Yeah. 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 But I, I'm seeing the final flourishing of the tree as okay. kind of being the kingdom mm -hmm. of so let's. We have one more parable to look at, so let's read it now. Uh, I'll read it. It's uh, verses 47 through 50. And while I'm reading it, ask yourself, what does this parable say about the end times? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what do we learn about the end times in the parable of the net? Again, there's going to be a separation of good and bad. Separation of good and bad, a judgment, right? Yeah. Who's going to who's going to do this separate who's doing the the angels the, the angels right we saw that in the previous mm -hmm. uh, parable as well we didn't we didn't pick up on that in the previous parable but there it was there it was there um, yeah what else do we see that in this parable about the end time the mm. angels will throw the bad into the fiery furnace yeah so definitely the parallel of that yeah, they're very direct, right? I mean, yeah. He's using the same words here: exactly fiery furnace, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, I mean, it's just it's the same same idea. Yeah, but I was thought I was picturing the end, like the judgment that it's going to be Jesus who's going to say, "Yes, yeah, no, I never knew you." He is. So, so you so, yeah, so so Jesus is the one who's making the decisions, but the angels are kind of carrying it out. Okay. So they're but yeah. they're they're doing the gathering too in the previous. Minute. So a question. Yeah. It says here like all kinds of fish, but then it brings it down to two different types. My question is, we have so many different denominations, and so is that to say that these gathering together is going to be from all different types of churches? So what do you think? I I always like to think that there are Christians in almost every religion. Um, they might not teach like or believe some of the things that I believe, but I believe well, except some like the extremists and stuff. That's what I think. That mm -hmm. yeah, it's a possibility that he's going to read from all different churches, not just like. The Christian Missionary Alliance, sure. and I'm thinking right. like, mm. but not the cults, though. No, so no, I wasn't the net cults. was out. Well, some of them are pretty, like, you know, like Extreme. people think that they're really Christian, like the Jehovah's yes, Witness and the yeah. Mormons and all that. So the net goes out and it gathers all sorts of fish, all sorts of mm -hmm. fish, and, um, and all the sorts of fish are sorted into two categories yeah. the good and the bad, mm -hmm. right? So ultimately, there's two categories. But there's all sorts of fish yeah. that wind up in in the net, mm -hmm. and um, so yeah, I, I think that you know uh, there's a lot of other passages we would need to look at to really answer your question. Um, but this passage certainly says that the net gathers in a lot of fish. Now the net is the kingdom of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what he says. The net is the kingdom of heaven is like a net. So the net is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I don't think it's it's off base to say that this includes the church, not just the church, but includes the church. So the church gathers in all sorts of people, some good, some bad, right? Um, the church is full of wheat and weeds, right? And it's going to be sorted out at the end. Um, and so th these are the two. So we have, we have uh, three minutes left. So um, let me ask you this. What do you see? What do these two passages have in common? What does it have in common? There's going to be a separation of at the end and really? judgment. Yeah. But I think also what's coming out to me is that good and bad was given the same opportunity. It was given out to all. Sure. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So you have your whole life to um, decide. Sure. how you're going to be how you're going to live your life yeah 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 and it brought back to something that you said when like when i went back to the, like the parable of the weeds like in sun, sun, sunday at church you said like while we we're waiting for all this to happen i guess this is why we don't fall asleep we continue with what we learn and do our christian i have I, I did not like that paper i don't know because it's coming down on sunday but you were saying to keep ourselves in the kingdom while we're awaiting the kingdom to come we still have work to do yeah, to, to and that's what this, this sunday is going to be even more about right. that hold on a second we're gonna we're gonna join one of the breakout rooms and just uh say and uh it's a friend recommended it to me and i mean I, I wouldn't normally think of choosing the africa bible commentary but 
<laughs> the reason my friend suggested it and why she liked it so much is because um, in Africa, they tend to be, I think, a lot more conservative in their beliefs. And so this co particular commentary is written uh, from a conservative, um, maybe more traditional point of view uh, rather than, oh. Hi guys. Uh, Hi. How are you doing? Do you need more time or are you getting getting there? No, we're good. We're good. good. All right. See you in a minute. The mustard seed is a little bit different. Yeah. The mustard seed doesn't they talk about seed. separation now in the dough to the yeast. Only the idea. Yeah. 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 Break up too. <laughs> We're, we're, we got less than a minute to go. Do you need more time or are you good? No, we're good. We are fine. Yeah, shortly. Yeah. The parable that he never gave them the explanation for. Like, the mustard seed. Oh, the yeah. Ones. Yeah. Because he asked them about the seed, the parable of the weeds explained. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's going to be somewhere else. But he didn't, because he says, Hi, Janet. Hi, oh, Janet. Huh. She's not with anybody's group, right? She just joined us. Hey there, Janet. Hi. Yeah, yeah, cool. Everybody is uh, joining us back here in the room. We've been uh, we've been in two breakouts, and the breakouts should be coming in here shortly. Yeah. That's not this. No, no. It's not, it's not, it's not. Yeah. Breakout room is going to be closed in about 25 seconds. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get everybody back. All right. This was a big experiment. We'll see how this went. <laughs> All right, I'm going to have to erase this. Well, it's good to do, like, read these passages before, the, before we come. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm doing. I thought it was going to be really tough for us to read six pounds. Okay, we are back. <laughs> Hi, Nana. Hi, Papa Man. <laughs> yeah, she calls me Papa Man. <laughs> I remind her every once in a while that I'm not her dad. <laughs> <laughs> not mine, but nonetheless, you are a father. My dad, but... <laughs> Father of my grandchildren, okay? I, I, I definitely <laughs> Call him Grandpapa Man. Yeah. Actually, yeah, my wife and I today, uh, my wife and I got to go on a little trip today. Uh, we went to visit the man who performed our wedding, the pastor who performed yeah, our wedding. Okay. We got to see him today. And um, as we were driving, it was an hour there, an hour back. Lots of time to talk in the car. And we were talking about, one of the things we were talking about was, if we have grandkids, what do we want to be called? What do we want to be called? <laughs> I think you have <laughs> Yeah, it's full, full, full okay. Right, welcome back, everybody. Um, so we had, we had six passages that we looked at in our groups. Um, and so uh, our group here looked at two, three parables, really. Um, one is the parable of the... Um, the weeds of the field. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna write that up here. Weeds of the field. Parable of the weeds. Okay, we looked at the parable of the mustard seed, which was really short, and the parable of the net. Okay, so that's that was what our group did. Mm -hmm. um, group number one, you did the wedding feast. And you did the bridesmaids, right? And versions. Bridesmaids. <laughs> <laughs> for bridesmaids. All right. And then uh, group number two, you did the talents and the sheep and the goats. Yes. All right. So, and you, add, you all answered two big questions. One was, what do we learn about the kingdom of God or the end times specifically. And then the second question was, what do these stories have in common? So I'm gonna ask the ladies here in the room who did these three parables, um, what are some things that we learned about the 
n times in these parables. Can you give me one or two things? There'll be a separation up between the good and the bad. Yeah, separation. And we, we call that judgment. Okay, in the end times, right? Between the good and the bad. What else did we learn? That the angels are the harvesters. The angels are angels do the harvest. What else? The kingdom of God. The good the kingdom of God. And the bad go to, I don't know, hell. The <laughs> burn. Furnace. And we had the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mm -hmm. Weeping and gnashing are, are two parts of that. Um, and then what did these two, what did these three parables have in common? They all mentioned that. They all have weeping and gnashing of teeth. Actually, the, the mustard seed mustard one was seed. a little weird. Yeah, it's mustard. The positive that's side. the positive one. Oh, this, you know, the big kingdom of God. Lots of great stuff happened. But the other two, the weeds and the net, we're talking about separation. Uh, the angels do the harvesting. The good go to the kingdom of God. The bad go to the, the fiery furnace. All right, let's look at uh, group number one. You guys had the wedding feast and the bridesmaids. Uh, can you guys share with me what's what are some things you learned about the the end times? Uh, so we there were many invitations to um, a lot of the people, and um, not everyone heeded the call. Um, so some did and some did not. Uh, there was a judgment and, um, you know, those who heeded the call had uh, a, a good fortune and those who did not, um, did not have a good fortune. And had weeping and gnashing of teeth. She likes that phrase. And we don't know that, that when they or the time don't know the day or the time. Okay, yeah, that's, that's important to both. Don't know the day or the time. Any, any, so the bad one had description of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Was there any description of where the good people went? To the banquet, banquet? the feast. Yeah, okay. Um, you, these two had a lot in common, right? And they're very, very similar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Group two. Um, you have this parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Um, what did you guys learn about the kingdom of God from these two parables? About the uh, end times. I'm sorry, the end times. Uh. Somebody from the town. There, so there'll be a time when, when Jesus comes and we have to give an account for what we've done. An account. <laughs> As the um, servants gave an account of what they did with their talents. Very good. Yep. What else? Uh, that there, there'll definitely be a time when he does this it's it's not it's not up in the air he'll definitely be doing this It'll be a definite time mm -hmm. good very good what else and the sheep the sheep and the goats there's going to be judgment between good and bad believers non-believers <clears throat> Uh, the righteous, the righteous, the unrighteous. Yeah. And um, what happens to the righteous? They will go with him to eternal life. Life. In the parable of the talents, uh, the 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 master. Um, 
It says, enter into the joy of your Lord. All right, so there's joy. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, what happens to the wicked? Does it say? What happens to the wicked? Like the dead and national Whoa! Yeah. Out. <laughs> Give that lady a cigar. Yeah, we have a winner. <laughs> At least in the parable of the talents, I don't remember it, what happens with the goats. Um, um, the goats, uh, they will go into eternal punishment. Eternal mm -hmm. punishment. Okay. So. Here's, this is Jesus, right? Okay, this is Jesus. So we've, now we've got the teaching of Jesus uh, about the end times through parables. Okay, so this is not, I mean, Jesus, is, next week we're going to talk about Jesus' direct teachings of, uh, about the end times. When he says, here's what's going to happen, and he's not just using, you know, a story to tell it, but he's, he's, teaching directly. But, but this week we're looking at these stories. And Jesus, in these stories, though, Jesus has some very consistent themes, right? The, yes. the first consistent theme is that the master is going to return. There's going to come a day, Amen. right? There's going to come a day. This is, this is teaching number one of Jesus, okay? There will come a day. Uh, it's gonna be the judgment day, right? It's going to be the, 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 the second coming. It's the, the gathering in of the net. It's the harvest at the end of the age. Um, it's the wedding feast, right? Um, but it, there is a definite day and a definite time when the master will return, when the net will be gathered, when the harvest will happen, okay? This is, a, this is an event that takes place. Um, and when does this event take place? At the end of the age, at the end of the age, right? That's, that's what Jesus consistently says. At the end of the age, this event will take place. Okay? All these things that we're going to talk about take place at the end, okay? Um, now, so let's take a step back. There's lots of teachings about, uh, about eschatology, about last things, okay? I believe that Jesus teaches that there will be a day, right? Amen. A event that's going to take place. Some of the some of the understandings of the end times say that the that the end times, uh, the eschatological things are things that are always the case. That it's sort of a it's sort of a it's a state that humankind is in. Okay. Um, my belief is that there's a definite day when this takes place. Right? There's a, it's, a, it's an event. It's not a, it's not a stage. It's not an age. It's an event. Okay? So the second thing that we see Jesus talking about here is that this event involves judgment. Okay? Amen. It involves judgment. Somehow, in every one of these parables, okay, people are separated into two groups. Okay? In the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the wheat and the weeds are gathered into two groups. Mm -hmm. One group is, you know, uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about what happens to them in a minute. But but one of the groups, good things happen to one of the groups, bad things happen to. Okay, um, so that's in the parable of the weeds. In the parable of the net, there's two kinds of fish. Right, mm -hmm. one goes into the buckets, one gets thrown back into the water. Uh, in the wedding feast, right, you got all the people. You got the people who refuse to come, then you got the people who agree to come. And then once you get the people who agree to come, you even got some who agree to come who get kicked out of the feast, right? Mm -hmm. The bridesmaids, same thing, right? You have two, two groups of bridesmaids and they're wise and they're foolish, right? There's mm -hmm. two groups. The, ta the parable of talents, you have the faithful servants and you have the wicked and lazy servant, right? Sheep and the goats, you got the sheep and the goats, right? Uh, 
there's going to come a day and that day will involve judgment, right? And the judgment is judging between two types of people. Now, if you, if you pay attention to these stories and some of the details in these stories, you get a little bit more of a well-rounded picture of what it means to be on the good side and what it means to be on the bad side, okay? Uh, he talks about sin and evil doing being removed from his kingdom, right? So sin and evil doing is somehow part of being part of the bad group, okay? Um, righteousness is somehow part of being part of the good group, okay? Uh, in the parable of the wedding feast, uh, you know, making sure you're wearing a wedding garment seems to be very important. You say yes to the invitation, and then when, you, when, you, when you're in there in the feast, you're wearing a wedding garment. That seems to be important. What does that mean? We'll talk about that, talk about that for a long time. We're not going to talk about it tonight. The bridesmaids, right? Wise and foolish bridesmaids. I preached about this on Sunday, right? The, the wise bridesmaids prepared for a long wait, right? They weren't, they weren't, they didn't just have short enthusiasm. They prepared for a long wait. That's part of being in the good group. Talents, the parable of talents, which we're going to talk about this Sunday, talks about investing what God has given you uh, into the work of the kingdom, right? That there's, that there's no such thing in his kingdom as sitting back and just waiting till the end comes, okay? Trying to wait it all out, just to not do any harm. I'm not going to sin, until the end, right? I'm just, that's what I'm focus on, not sinning, not sinning, not sinning, not, no, no, that's not it, right? You gotta be out there doing good. That's, you gotta be investing what God has given you. And the sheep and the goats is even more about that. The sheep and the goats talk, and we'll talk about that in two weeks. The sheep and the goats talks about a specific deeds, right? Done, and it's not just deeds done in church, but it's deeds done to the least of these, right? Going out there and, and, and serving those who are the least of these is, is part of, the sheep and the goats judgment, right? What about the idea that you can't earn your way into heaven? Yeah. So, yeah, so here we are giving an account for deeds when yeah. really that so, shouldn't have anything to do with anything. So here's the, here's the big scary secret of all these parables. You ready? <laughs> the big scary secret of all these parables is that all of these parables are about the kingdom of God. They're not about the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, every person that's being talked about here is in the net. Every fish is in the net. Yeah. Every, every, weed, every weed and every wheat is in the field, right? Mm -hmm. Every person talked about in the wedding feast story is in the feast. They're invited to the feast, right? Um, the bridesmaids all have an invitation. This is all, it's talking about, all talking about people who have received the grace of God first, mm -hmm. okay? So can you earn your salvation? No, right? They've all had an invitation. It, this all happens after the invitation. None of this, none of this happens before the invitation. Mm -hmm. um, this all happens at the end of time, after grace has been given, okay? Is it received? This is, after grace has been given, is, it, is that grace acted upon? Um, that's the question, right? It's not about salvation. It's not, not primarily about salvation, okay? This is being judged. As to do, the people who are judged here are those who have received the grace um, and have said no and have, and have rejected the grace. Yeah. Uh, so challenging stuff, right? But, but yeah. this, these, these may not even be about non-Christians at all. Mm -hmm. it, it might, this might all be about Christians, maybe. Um, which is a scary thing, right? The sheep and the goats. Um, what does Jesus say to the, to the goats? We didn't read the parable of the goats, but the goats say, well, when did we see you? Yeah, that's what we didn't talk about. When, when did we see you uh, hungry or thirsty or naked and we didn't do something for you? And Jesus said, well, but you didn't do it for the least of these. You didn't yeah. do it for me. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of Christians fall in that category, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what about the person who... They are, they just go off on a mountaintop and just by themselves. Yeah. But, they just pray a little bit. So here, here's the other cool secret, and that is that judgment belongs to the Lord. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Where is the um, 
talent uh, parallel. What's in the show? Yeah, parallel talents. We talked about in two 25, weeks. 25, 14, 14 through 30. 30. Um, so. Anyway, so we talked about two themes, right? One is that there's going to come a day, right? It's an event. The second is that there'll be judgment on that day, the sorting into two groups. And the third big theme that I see is the theme of reward, okay? There's a theme of reward. Um, for the righteous, there's one reward. For the wicked, there's another reward, okay? The righteous will have joy. They'll build nests in the kingdom of God. They'll enjoy the marriage feast. They'll have eternal life. They'll inherit the kingdom. They will shine like the sun, right? There's this, there's all these descriptions of the reward of the just, but then the reward for the wicked is weeping and gnashing of teeth in many of these parables, right? Uh, eternal fire and eternal punishment. Um, this is the, the big sort, it puts, it winds up putting people into two categories and those two categories have two very different eternal destinies, right? Eternal life, <coughs> eternal punishment. These are the two categories that are categories of reward uh, that follow the judgment. Reward may be a better description for what happens for the righteous, um, but it's, it's, it's that which is due um, to them. I see those three themes in every one of these parables, right? There's the parable that there's, there's going to come a day where there's going to be a judgment. And based on that judgment, there will be an eternal destiny that awaits uh, every person who goes through the judgment. Okay? These are the, the three big themes of these parables of Jesus. What did you guys see? Anything that I, anything I missed? What, what are some things that you saw here that well, something don't that fit into this category? Not even, but something that you pointed out that we didn't really look at when we said, um, we talked about Satan being evil and that sort of seed, where you said Jesus and Satan are both in the field trying to do their sowing. Like right, Jesus right. is sowing the good seed and Satan is sowing the bad seed. So like, I don't want to say it's a fight because Christ is already the one, but Satan sure. is still battling to see if he can get whoever he can get. Right, so yeah, there, there is, in the parable of the weeds and the wheat, there definitely is a, an enemy <laughs> who is trying to stop the plans of the master. Right? So there is a judgment between the people, but uh, the people aren't just on their own. Right? There is, uh, there is a, a master and his angels who are you know, tending the field, and there is an evil one who is trying to, uh, trying to pervert, the, uh, pervert the master's work. Right. So who did you say... Um thought that the end times were now or not a definite day just that's an interesting an idea. age an age what if it's not Who right are those people so um let's uh let me this is something i i haven't been doing much of but we'll, i'll give you some end times terminology okay so sue's sue's question is who are the people who say that the that the end times or that the, the, the this tribulation period or the end times is the period that we are all in, right? Um, and I'm trying to remember the, I'm trying to remember the term. Um, what if it's different for each person? What if the end of the age is each person's individual death? Well, okay, well let's, let's, let's talk about that in just a second. Okay. Um, so there's, there's several different ideas about interpretations about the end times. One is called preterism. Oh, you gave us a chart yeah. paper. That's yeah, so oh, yeah. this was on a chart. Yeah, so preterism. Yeah. Preterism believes that all of this stuff happened in AD 70. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
all this teachings about the end times happened on AD 70. Um, and, but the truth is that almost nobody, almost no Christian is an actual preterist. Uh, a, the other term is partial preter, preterism. And that's what most of the Christians who hold this are, the partial preterists, believing that most of this happened in AD 70, but at the end of time, there will come a judgment and the return of Christ. Okay, so there's two things. Most of what Jesus predicted happened in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, but, but a few things are waiting till the end of time. Okay, there's futurism, which says that these end times events um, that are prophesied, all of them, or the vast majority of them, are still to come. They have not yet happened. Okay. And then, and I'm not coming up with the term here, but I'm going to call it sort of metaphorism or whatever. I don't think that's the right term. Um, but metaphorism is the term I'm making up right now for it. These are folks who believe that all of the teaching about the troubles and tribulations uh, that Jesus prophesies about our everyday life from the time when Jesus came the first time until the time he comes again, that there's not a specific end time with specific events, but all of those things are prophecies for all the stuff that we always go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to actually, yeah. so I can give you the right term. I'm going to look That's it an up. Interesting idea. Uh, it is. Where it is that he says, Jesus says, he will come back. Because he doesn't say that in any of these parables. Not in the parables, no. He, no. he does in a lot of places. Um, he said it when he rose from the dead and he was going away. Yeah. Something. Ideally. So, yeah. So the disciples hearing these parables would never, ever figure this out. Because he never said it. What? That's not true. Um, so what Sue is saying is that Jesus never said he was coming back. In these parables. Not, in, not now, in not these, until later. In these parables, he doesn't. Yeah. So Jesus is, Jesus is taught, Jesus didn't teach everything in one city. No. Right? So, no. Jesus walked the earth with his disciples for three years, <laughs> taught them a lot, mm -hmm. and as he kept on going through his teaching, he kept on teaching them more and more. Mm -hmm. um, one of the last things that Jesus teaches his disciples is that he's coming back. Right? Um, this is this is the, the end of his teaching is that he's coming back mm -hmm. and um and so jesus uh, uh, says it to his disciples just before his death he says it to his disciples after his resurrection and then the angels who see the disciples after jesus resurrection say it again um, so this is and then of course the book of revelation uh jesus says i am coming soon so there is there's a, a bunch of direct teaching from Jesus and the angels that he sends to the extent that he is coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and the truth is, um, there's no Christian belief that says he's not coming back. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pregarists, futurists, and idealists. Idealists is the right term, not metaphorists. <laughs> Preterists, futurists, and idealists all believe Jesus is coming back someday. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's a common belief among all Christians. Um, yeah. Any questions from on Zoom or thoughts from on Zoom? We, have, we still have a little bit of time, more time than I thought we had, so we, we have plenty of time still to come. Any thoughts on these passages that we've talked about or any questions about the passages we've talked about? From our passage, I have 101. Um, when the servants came and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed? Where did the weeds come from? And he said, An enemy did this. And then they said, Do you want us to pull it up? So it's, is it saying that the angels I know are the harvester, but those who are working with Jesus had no idea, like, how did the devil just work himself into your field? 
because they just went and they saw to, like it sounded as if they were like totally surprised like how could this happen well I'm thinking like I was like, you are my boss and I work for you and something has happened in the office. I am so shocked I see that. How could you not say it, that the enemy just came in and did this? So how does that tie in with all the other scriptures, including what you're teaching on Sundays, about us staying awake and seeing? Right. Yeah. Like, so the, the, two, um, the two passages that we dealt with here in the, in the room were had as a, a subtext to them was that the church contains both good and bad. Okay, that there are both good and bad in the church. The, uh, the parable of the, the wheat and the weeds, there's both wheat and weeds growing up in the master's field. And the angels are like, well, how'd they get there? And should, do you want us to pull them up? And Jesus says, no, don't pull them up because you might get the wheat and the weeds confused. You might, you might not be able to tell the difference between the wheat and the weeds. We don't want to hurt the wheat while we're pulling up the weeds, right? So it's, this is talking about a church that's full of both good and bad people. And you don't always know who's who, right? Um, and it, you won't necessarily know until the harvest. Um, but the question is, uh, why are the angels confused about where the weeds come from? And on this, what I would say is, uh, you have to look at the other passages of scripture to tell in a parable what's important and what's not important, what's just part of the story and what's actually meaningful. And the truth is in the rest of scripture, the angels have a, have a, a good deal of knowledge of what's going on, but not complete knowledge. So I think that what I would say is that in this story of the wheat and the weeds, the reason the angel, the, the reason the workers ask the question is because it's a story that Jesus is telling and Jesus wants to get to that point and he needs a way to get to that point, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's just a storytelling device that the, that, the, that the servants are like, master, did you not grow, sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? This is, this is just a way to get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's actually a description of the angels, the extent of the angels' knowledge. I could be wrong. But He's that's not it. saying that the angels won't know. He's saying that the people won't know. It's the people who ask should they read them out. Right. With the, and the, the servants are the angels, he says. Yeah, the oh, old okay. servants. Yeah. Yeah. But says, angels don't know everything. They'll no. talk they be God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the angels don't know everything. And, uh, you know, this is, I'll tell you guys this on the Zoom. This is something we talked about here in the room. That uh, I use this passage, the passage of the wheat and the weeds, all the time in talking with other pastors and talking with, with church leaders. Um, church discipline is a very difficult thing, right? Um, have, uh, making a determination uh, about, you know, is, is somebody in the church acting so bad uh, and so, is so resistant to the teaching of Jesus that we have to kick them out of the church, right? That, that's the hardest decision that we ever have to make in church leadership. We never, we don't wanna do it ever. And, uh, and it's something that we, we go to very, very carefully. Um, I've been a pastor now for uh, 14 years, right? And in 14 years, uh, we've had to do it once <laughs> in 14 years. Um, We've done it once in 14 years. <laughs> Whether we've had to do it other times and I didn't do it, I don't, <laughs> the Lord will tell me. But um, it's, it's such a big deal because the truth is wheat and weeds look very similar, right? The wheat and the weeds look very similar. And, and I'm always telling my leaders when, it, when this question comes up, we have to be careful that we don't hurt the wheat, right? Uh, not hurting the wheat is more important than getting out every weed. Um, I, I think that a lot of Christians, and here I'll, I'll, I'll preach a little bit. Uh, a lot of Christians <clears throat> spend their time trying to do the job of weeding out the field, right? Um, I, have a lot of, I know a lot of Christians mm -hmm. who wanna just say, okay, you're a Christian, you're not a Christian. You're a Christian, you're not a Christian. You're a Christian, you're not a Christian. But actually what they want to say is, 
you're a Christian, you're a Christian, and you, 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 you are not a Christian. They'd rather have more people who aren't because their, their spiritual gift is kicking people out. Um, and yeah, right, exactly. Thank you for catching my sarcasm. Um, that is not the approach that Jesus takes in this parable. And, um, you know, again, I don't want to push parables too hard, but I think this is actually well reflected in the rest of the New Testament that, um, that, that um, church discipline, that making the decision, the final step of church discipline, making the decision to excommunicate somebody um, is something that is even difficult for angels. Um, it's, it's definitely difficult for me and it's definitely difficult for human leaders. And I wanna be very, very cautious about ever doing that. Um, there's, if you've been with me for any length of time, you'll know that there are a few people that I say clearly are heretics, okay? Um, and I, I'll just come out and say it. Uh, those people who are teachers of the word faith movement, mm -hmm. I will call out as heretics every single day of my life until I run out of breath. Um, and the reason is because I believe that they're leading people to their doom. They're leading people to death. Um, and included in that are people like Joel Osteen, uh, who is, you know, I think a, a very huge example. Um, uh, Kenneth Copeland is another. Um, there's a Creflo Dollar. Uh, there's a ton of word faith movement teachers, and their teaching is that if you have enough, if you give enough money, then then you're saved. Uh, and that is. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And I will, to my dying day, will say that that is heresy and I'll call out every person who teaches that. Um, but that's only, the only reason I do that is because I think it's so dangerous and so deadly and so clear that it's wrong. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Um, and it's, it's all about, it's all about, you know, prosperity and that Christianity is all about prosperity in this life. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it has to do with giving, give me money, give me money and good things will come your way. And, and the Bible does not promise that. Um, but the truth is there's a lot of Christians I disagree with. There's a lot of Christians I disagree with uh, who I, who I cherish as my brothers and sisters in Christ. Right. And, uh, I'm not going to call them heretics. Even though we disagree strongly, I don't believe that they're leading people to damnation. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to harm the wheat while trying to pull out the weeds. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a Methodist, but I love, I'm married to a Methodist, right? So I, I love Methodists. I'm not a Catholic, but I have many strong Catholic Christian friends, right? So I'm, not, I'm going to be very careful to not harm the wheat uh, by trying to pull out the weeds. Um, you know, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, you know, the, many, many friends who are beloved, strong Christians in all those camps. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a Calvinist, but I have many friends who are Calvinists. Uh, I'm not a Pentecostal, but I have many friends who are Pentecostal. Um, and it's not just being my friend that matters, <laughs> but I, I know when I say they're my friend, I'm saying that I know that they know Jesus. These are many people who know Jesus and who Jesus knows them. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to cast <laughs> stones at different denominations um, because I don't want to harm the wheat uh, while I'm trying to pull out the weeds. Um, and one of the, I think one of the dangers of the Christian internet is that the Christian internet is filled with weed pullers. That, that's all they want to do is pull weeds. And I get the impulse. They want to protect the flock, and, and that's good. Um, but I think that we need to heed the warning in, the, in this parable that uh, you're not really good at it. <laughs> not really good at it. So. Other, other questions, thoughts? We have five minutes to go. In, one of the, in the parable of the ten bridesmaids, um, it says that there's five that had enough oil and then five that were foolish and didn't have enough oil. And we only touched on this briefly when we were talking about it, but 
Do you think those numbers reflect the proportions of people who will be saved as to not saved, or are those just random numbers? That's a very good question. Um, uh, here's what I believe about those numbers. Um, I don't want to be dogmatic about it, okay? So, but the, I'm looking at that parable from a storytelling perspective. I love to tell stories. So I, I, I always want to. I, I always want to look at these things from a storytelling perspective first. And from a storytelling perspective, if it was one wise virgin and one foolish virgin, okay, that's nice. Um, I, I think it, it would very much so. that what would that we, what you would get from that is that uh, is um, that it, it's sort of an individualistic approach. So I, I think I think what Jesus Jesus made it more than one of each. Because, uh, because he's doing so good. Just one, I think, would have given it a, a wrong impression. But I think he gives five as a round number. I think he gives ten as a round number because it's two fives. Um, you can count it on your hands, right? It's it's when you're telling the story, you can say five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. I just think this is a really simple way to tell the story. Um, I don't. Um, I don't believe that it is that he's giving percentages. No, uh, everywhere what we looked through now, the creation or the gift is kind of demonstrate equal. Uh, so it's not the number, but the fact that everybody got that gift. Sure. So, so but, but uh, what we do visit is the part which will separate us. Sure. Another, another reason you might not think that it's an exact percentage is in the parable of the talents, right? <laughs> in the parable of the talents, you have three servants, right? And two of them are faithful and one of them is wicked, right? Um, so uh, I don't think that the 10 virgins are giving us a percentage any more than I think that the three servants are giving us a percentage. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Uh, you know, Jesus also said uh, early on, Matthew 6, maybe, or 7, Jesus said that, you know, uh, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there are that find it. And narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few there are that find it. Um, I, what I suspect is that the, the two gates are talking about all people everywhere. And these parables are talking about the church. Um, so I think the church, within the church of Jesus Christ, I think there's many more saved uh, than unsaved in the church. That's my belief. In the world, I think there's many more unsaved than saved. Um, and uh, so that's, that's how I look at it. Um, this is the gospel according to Danish. This is not. Uh, <laughs> there's no no. I don't. Have, I'm not putting any warranty on that. <laughs> well, that makes and, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. Sure. So when we first look at Daniel's and the dreams that interpreted like the kingdoms that were to come, and then Jesus comes and he speaks in parables, and those parables are geared towards people. What's the correlation there? Kingdoms, people. Um, like, was it because Jesus was not yet crucified that he spoke in parables? Or was it because he wanted, to, like you said, just like Daniel didn't get to know everything, he wasn't going to reveal everything? So what's yeah. the time? So the, the reason Jesus speaks in parables, and Jesus actually tells us why he speaks in parables, okay? Um, the, the reason why Jesus speaks in parables is so that people who don't want to hear, don't have to hear. That's the reason Jesus speaks in parables. Jesus speaks in parables so that people who don't want to hear, don't have to hear, okay? He's, the, the idea here is that there are people in this world who really don't want the truth, okay? And you can tell them the truth and they will plug their ears, mm -hmm. right? So Jesus, taught the crowd in parables because there were people who don't really want to hear. They just want their ears to be tickled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't teach his disciples in parables ever. 
or no, that's not true. Let me back up that. Jesus rarely taught his disciples in parables. When Jesus taught his disciples, he taught clearly, explicitly uh, what was going to happen. And when we get to next week, we'll see Jesus teaching his disciples. In these ones, he's teaching the crowds. His disciples come to him and say, that parable you told to the crowds, what does it mean? And then Jesus tells them what it means. Mm -hmm. um, so Jesus' parables are, in, in a way, a miniature judgment day. Okay? Jesus' parables are a miniature judgment day. When Jesus tells the parables, people sort themselves into two groups, right? Uh, and it's his parable that does the work. Right? They sort themselves into two groups, people who want to hear more and people who don't want to hear more. Um, and um, some people think that Jesus told parables because it was an easier way for people to understand. But the scriptures, ex but Jesus explicitly says, that's not why he does it. He doesn't do it so it's easier to understand. He does it so it's harder to understand. Um, which is not what I want him to say, right? I want Jesus to oh, you know, tell everybody everything, right? No, but Jesus, what Jesus was like, Jesus said, like, look, there's some people who just don't want to hear. Let's give them the opportunity to leave, right? Let's give them the opportunity to, to pass judgment on themselves. Um, and uh, he's going to invest his time in the people who are eager to hear more. He's going to invest his time in those who want to grow in the kingdom. Um, and... Uh, that's not how we approach things. Uh, it's not how we approach things. So it's, it's very scary, scary. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right, well, we've reached 8.30 and um, I wanna honor the, honor the time that we have. Thank you guys for joining me. Did this work better for Zoom? Oh, much better, much better. Yes, yes. I, I felt like we were hearing you guys a lot better. Yeah. And yes. And we're now, we're having a conversation now, an hour and a half into this. You're not, you're not two minutes late or, yeah, so that, that's really good. Um, I will post the video, but I, if, if, you've, if you've seen all this, you don't probably need the video, but the video will be up on our YouTube channel. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the teaching of Jesus about the day that is coming, the day that is coming on which judgment will happen you will your son jesus will return to this world and he will judge the earth and he will separate the sheep from the goats he'll separate the wheat from the weeds he'll separate the good fish from the bad the wise bridesmaids from the foolish that's the day that we're looking forward to lord i pray that you'd help us to look forward to that day with joy and anticipation and not with fear and trembling, but that we would know that as we pursue you, as, it, as we let you do your work in our, our lives, as we uh, pursue you with zeal, that we can know that, uh, that we are uh, part of your kingdom and that we can look forward to the judgment day with confidence and eager anticipation and not with fear. And I do, Lord, thank you for what we talked about in our group, that the, wheat, that the weeds can become wheat in your kingdom, uh, that you have, a, you have the sort of kingdom where the weeds are becoming wheat all the time. Um, so, Lord, in this intermediate time, in this now and not yet time, Lord, I pray for many, many, many more weeds to become wheat, many more foolish bridesmaids to become wise, um, that you are, are bringing more and more people into your wedding feast. And, Lord, may we be among those who give out the invitations uh, to the people all around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Love you guys. Love you. Good night. Love Thank you. you. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Nana. God bless.